Tonight I'm playing in the largest private game of my life. It's Randy's 51025 game and I buy in for $5,000. The stakes are high and the action is crazy. I bluff all in with fifth pair in a $6,000 pot and then shove all in with ace high heads up in the knit game. The action starts now. First hand we look down at king jack of spades from the big blind and I open it up to $75. Pretty standard so far, we're going heads up to the flop when middle position puts in the call, and we flop ourselves a flush draw spades to be exact and two overcards on a 10-6-3 board. Could be checking, could be betting my entire range. I decide to check as I think he'll have more of the pocket sixes and threes than myself. He denies it though and checks it back, bringing in the queen of hearts, giving myself six more outs. I have three more ace outs giving me Broadway, and I also pick up three nine outs. So yeah, we have a bunch more outs here, and I think now when he checks back the flop, I wanna go for a stab here and try to take it down with my king high. The opponent does not oblige. He puts in the call. So we're gonna look to see one of a few cards on the river, and a board pairing six of diamonds is not that. However, when he checks behind on the flop and then calls the turn, he could have some spades. I do double block it having the king and jack of spades in my hand. He also could just have a weak top pair like 10-9 or 10-8. Of course, he could have a queen, but we're going to have to see what he has. I'm going to fire out here and try to get him to fold. At the end of the day, I just have king high. I don't really want this to go check check and he shows me a hand like pocket eights or pocket sevens. I think I can get that to fold with a $350 bet but not when he snap calls me and turns over ace-queen offsuit. Unfortunately, I ran into the top of his range here. Probably betting the flop might have got him to fold. Just not a great board to do it on, and he's going to take down that $1,300 pot straight out of the gate. And now, probably the best hand of the night, the second hand I play, 5-4 of clubs from the big blind. Yes, you know we have taken leaps and strides in this channel when I am saying that the best hand of this vlog is 5-4 of clubs. Cashman, a local crusher here in the Dallas area, raises it up to $75 from the hijack. The cutoff puts in the call and the button does as well, opening the door for myself to go for a nice little squeeze. If I'm going to do it with all of the premiums, I also have to throw in some garbage hands as well. This might be a little bit too crappy to do it, but don't tell me that. I go for the 3-bet to 450 and the action's back over to Cashman. Cashman says, hold up, wait, I still have a decent hand here, and I'm going to increase it to $950, a very, very strong looking 4-bet. He might just be thinking that I'm trying to set the tone early here with a weak 3-bet, so he comes in for that $950, which clears out the other two opponents, but uh, I came to play here. I have a good amount of chips behind. I put in the call with my 5-high, and we are going off to a flop, which definitely favors his range, although we do make a pair, ace-10-4 with two hearts. Not going to be donking into the preflop for better. Don't get any ideas here. I check it over to Cashman, and he goes for a very, very small one-fifth the size of the pot for $400. I can't really be raising this as he still can have pocket tens and pocket aces, so I decide to put in the call. I made bottom pair, and let's see what happens on the turn. The turn's a complete break, it comes a 7 of diamonds, and I check it over to Cashman once again. Any of his super strong hands like ace king, ace queen, pocket aces, and pocket tens, I would expect to continue to bet. The reason is there's a lot of hands that I'm going to continue with on the flop that he probably wants to charge. For instance, my hand exactly, 4 or 5, if he can put me on it, he doesn't want to see a 4 or 5 on the river. Also, the heart draw is out there. I could also have floated him with a hand like king-queen with like the king of hearts. Stuff like that, I think he probably should go for another bet with all of his strong hands. And then mix and check behind with some of his uh, mediocre hands and weak ones as well. However, if he does check behind, that kind of opens the door for me to have some ideas on the river. Which is exactly what happens. Cashman gives me some rope and checks behind on the turn. The turn is an interesting one. It brings in a bunch of draws. The eight of hearts comes in. So obviously that front door heart draw is complete. Jack nine has a straight now. I don't know if I would have floated him on the flop with that light of a hand. But yeah, I mean, the front door heart draw is a thing. And I also could easily have a hand like ace 10, ace queen, ace jack. So if I had a flush, if I had top pair and he checks back the turn, uh, there's only really one sizing to go for, and that's jam all in for $2,700. The reason why I want to pick the sizing is if I have any bluffs, for instance, the hand that I have, I would also want it to be consistent with all of my value. So I decided to jam it all in, which is a nearly pot-sized bet, and it puts Cashman in a tough spot. 
If you guys were in Cashman's spot with a hand like pocket jacks or pocket queens, what are you doing here with an ace on board and the hearts completing on the river? It's just not a great spot. I think some of the times you gotta put the money in, some of the times you have to respect the opponent, AKA me, and find the fold, which after around a minute of deliberation, Cashman decides to fold his cards and we get it through that $5,600 pot being shipped over to me. And to make it more interesting, seat one asks to see what hand I have. So I tell him only for you, you can look at it. He looks at the cards and then flips them up for the table to see. I guess they're knowing early on that we came to play. Pair of four is gonna take down this $5,600 pot in what assuredly could not have been the best hand out of the two. All right, the knit game is on for $100 a pop. So we definitely don't wanna lose this because it would be $700 to pay everybody out. I look down at the Doyle Brunson, 10 do suited, and I raise it up to $100 over a limp from the small blind. We see a flop, which gives me a pair, king, 10, nine with two clubs. Opponent checks it to me. Good board to go for a bet on. I make it 75 and he puts in the call. A lot of things he could continue with that are worse than my pair of 10s. So when the six of hearts peels off on the turn and he checks it over to me, probably could be betting once more for value. Also could be checking behind if I think he has many kings or better 10s in his range. He also could have queen jack offsuit and queen jack suited, although I think those would check raise the flop. So I decided to check behind and that allows a free card to come in. Hopefully it's not a club and it's not. It comes the three of hearts. When the opponent polarizes now and bets for a nearly pot sized bet, he's saying he has a very strong hand or a very weak one. The very weak ones would be all of his missed club draws, maybe a hand like ace jack suited, maybe a nine that's trying to get me to fold my 10. I don't think this is a snap fold. In fact, I think it's honestly a call. His strong hands are gonna be backdoor flushes, maybe a set of sixes or nines, and then some random king X. Don't really think he's going this large with a 10. He'd probably just check it over to me. So I decided to put my money where my mouth is, put in the $300, and hopefully he just shows me a worse hand. Unfortunately though, he did in fact back into the heart flush, queen seven of hearts, taking down this $960 pot, and another not great piece of news as we do not get to get rid of our knit button, and uh, he's gonna get rid of his. That last hand was so crucial and here's why. Now we're heads up in the knit game, the only other player we're battling it with still, goes into his bag of tricks and makes it $500 preflop. Of course it folds back around to me. Am I gonna defend the knit game with eight nine offsuit? We are deep so I could probably put it in, but I'm not that crazy, at least not this early on in the session. So unfortunately I am forced to fold my cards and in turn, I have to pay out the bounty to every player at the table. This next hand is super interesting. Under the gun raises it to 75. Cashman in the hijack comes in for a three bet. Action folds around to me, but before I even have a chance to act, Under the Gun puts in the call. So knowing that information, does that incentivize me to go for a four bet, knowing Under the Gun is just calling the 250, or should I just put in the flat call and go three ways to a flop? I decided to play it a little bit more passively. Cashman's range is still uncapped, meaning if I go for a four bet, Cashman could easily just shove it in my face and I'd be in a gross spot. So I put in the 250, off to a flop we go. I'd love to see a 10 or a bunch of undercards and option B is what we get. The poker gods say you're gonna see a flop which comes 866 with two clubs. Obviously I'm not gonna bet into the aggressor. So I check it over to Cashman who decides to check behind. I think this is a good board for him to check with a lot of his range. He still could be doing this with jacks and queens. He also could be doing this with ace king, ace queen. So just because he checks here on the flop doesn't mean he doesn't have a better hand than ours. But the three of clubs on the turn is an interesting one because now he could very easily have the ace or king of clubs in his hand. Still with an uncapped range, I'm not gonna bet into Cashman. I check it over to him. And now he decides to go for a small one third pot size bet for $765. Could we check raise here? I think that's a little ambitious. We'd really only be targeting hands like ace king offsuit with the ace of clubs, king queen offsuit with the king of clubs, stuff like that. Instead, I'm just gonna put in the call, hope to see a brick on the river and then probably pay off another bet. However, the villain from under the gun goes into the tank and says, don't forget about me, you guys. I'm still in the hand. I have every right to fight for it as well and tosses in 250. So just like that, we are going off to the river in a $1,500 pot, which is about as bad as it gets, the four of clubs. Now any club has me beat, so obviously I'm going to check. The action surprisingly checks through on the river, meaning there's a chance that we're good. 
until I realized I was never good as Under the Gun had uh, played pocket jacks in a very interesting way, deciding to not go for the 4-bet preflop, giving Cashman a lot of credit, and then backing into the club flush. 1,500 going over his way and not into our stack, which is not great news. I'm going to top up for 1,400 additional dollars and then work my way into this next hand with Jack-10 of spades. I find myself in the cutoff and Randy in the hijack puts in the limp for $25. I make it $100 to go, he puts in the call, and we are going heads up, mono e mono to a flop with the owner of this game, it's Randy's game. How can I possibly beat him in a hand? Oh, I guess if it comes jack 10-7 with two diamonds. Randy checks to me, I think this is a great board to continue to get value from. He's gonna call with any pair and any diamond draw, any gutter to a straight as well. So into the $240 pot comes a C bet, I go for 125 smackaroonies. Randy snap calls and the ace of clubs peels off on the turn. He checks it over to me for a second time. I'm hoping he doesn't have a hand like ace 10 or ace jack now. I still got to bet and get value from all of those diamond draws. So I go for a $300 bet into the $500 pot. Around 60% the size of the pot. I'm really just trying to charge all of those draws and one pair type of hands. And Randy decides he's going to put in the call and stick in there for one more card. And we're off to the river in an $1,100 pot, which comes about as bad as it gets. The king of diamonds peels off. Not only can he improve to some two pairs, any queen now has a straight, and the most obvious front door draw is complete. To make matters worse, or honestly make my decision a little bit easier, Randy decides to donk out into me into the $1,100 pot to the tune of $500. It's kind of a cool game here where you can bet with $100 bills. It's kind of like the Golden Nugget in Vegas and some of those old time casinos, how they used to play. He bets out for $500 in real USD and I make a snap fold. My Jack-10 can't be good, surely. And uh, Randy turns over the Queen of Clubs, letting me know that he did in fact have me beat. Nice hand, sir. Please invite me back to the game next time. Right, Cashman raises the cutoff to $75 and Benham calls from the button. I am in the $25 blind and decide to come in for a 3-bet to $350. Only Cashman completes for the additional monies and uh, we are off to a flop which comes 10 for 3 with 1 spade. Not exactly the best board for my range. I would expect Cashman to possibly have more of the 4s and 3s than myself. I think we both are going to have the same amount of pocket 10s. And then I should have a lot more of the aces and kings, so not exactly the worst board to continue for a c-bet on, and I go for $300. Cashman's a sticky player and puts in the call. The turn gives me a few more outs to the wheel. It comes the deuce of diamonds, so I don't slow down. I continue betting, telling the story I have a decent overpair. 450 is the price of poker. Surprisingly, I decide to go for a small bet, and it might have worked, making him think that I have a value hand. Cashman folds his cards. $1,400 coming over my way. All right, I raise the hijack with my favorite hand, Pocket Sevens, and Nathan, our good buddy who's a Twitch streamer for Fortnite, puts in the call, leading us off, heads up to a flop, which comes 6-6 six, six, deuce. Pretty good board for myself. I have two pair, which is hard to make in the game of No Limit Texas Hold'em. I fire out for $100. Nathan puts in the call. Another sticky opponent here, and we are off to the turn, which is an interesting one, the Five of Spades. Brings in the most obvious front door draw. What is he calling me with on the flop that's not a six? He could have a hand like three, four, and now has a straight. He could also have two spades and now have a flush. Either way, there's not many hands that call the flop that uh, I'm better than now, so I decide to check it over to Nathan. It's 500 in the middle, and he bets for 225. Even though there's a lot of hands I just mentioned that have me beat, still want to get sticky, put in the call, and see what he does on the river. That's what I decide to do, and in a $940 pot, the river comes the four of diamonds. When I check it over to Nathan for a third time, I would expect him to check behind with a lot of his bluffs. However, that's not what he does. He bets out for $800. So at this point, I'm putting him on a lot of value. He could have any random assortment of 6x. He could have pocket 2s, pocket 5s, a flush, 3, 4, all of that good stuff. So I decide to relinquish my hand. I think I make a great fold until 
completely owning me in this private game. He turns over Jack 10 of Hearts for the complete airball bluff, $1,700 going over his way, but a great play by him, bluffing old Wolfgang in this one. And uh, Nathan, let's not forget who invited you to this game, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying that. I'm just saying. All right, 4200 in our stack. I raise up Pocket Nueves to $75. And Nathan, once again, has my number, puts in the call, leading the small blind, a.k.a. Paolo, a good player here at TCH Live in all of the games in the Dallas area. Comes in for the 3-bet to $385. That clears out a few of the other players who didn't have much invested. But uh, I have 75 bucks in there, so I'm going to put in the call. I'm going to go to the streets with Paolo, maybe Nathan. We'll see. But uh, I'm the only one to put in the call. Nathan gets out of the way. Heads up. In position with Paolo on a very interesting board, which comes Jack, Jack, 4. Not exactly sure who's going to have more of the Jacks, but when Paolo checks it over to me, my immediate thought goes to he's going to have a lot of overcards here, like Ace, King, King, Queen, King, 10 suited, Ace, Queen suited, all of that good stuff. So when he checks over to me, I want to protect my pocket nines versus a lot of those overcards, and I go for a bet of $450. Another kind of cool side note to going for a bet on this flop is if he just calls me and then the turn comes a scare card, I could check behind essentially seeing a free river. That's what I decided to do. 450 is the price and Paolo puts in the call, bringing us off to the turn which isn't a scare card. It comes the seven of clubs. So when he checks it over to me for a second time, I think he might be floating the flop with hands like ace king of hearts, ace king of spades ace queen of hearts and queen of spades as well so continuing to bet here into the eighteen hundred dollar pot i go for a sizing of eight hundred dollars just really trying to get paolo to think about it with all of those overcard type hands and fold or put in the money in a bad situation still when he finds the fold we take down the pot pocket nine's good enough for eighteen hundred dollars and uh, a couple hundred dollar bills are coming over my way as well somehow some way we have amassed five hundred dollars worth of pure profit in this private game so far it has been profitable i usually don't leave the house in the day to go play some daytime poker but you know five hundred dollars of profit the session is not over yet but we're feeling pretty good ace four of clubs from the cutoff and i decide to come in for sixty dollars when an opponent from under the gun puts in the raise could be three betting, could be calling, but hands like this where you're drawing to the nuts, it can't be too bad just flat calling the 60 bucks. And we see ourselves a gutter to the wheel on a 5-5 deuce board, which really can't be too good for under the gun's range. He checks it over to me. There's $160 in the middle to fight for. And I say, this is much better for myself than you. And I bet for $75. Paolo's a good player though. And sometimes he's going to have check raises in this spot. In this spot, he goes for the min click to 150, which is a little bit strange. I don't really know what to make of it, but I'm definitely not folding. I'm definitely also not three betting. Instead, I put in the call, bringing us off to the turn, which comes the queen of clubs, giving me an additional set of outs, and I'll pick out the nut club flush draw. He doesn't slow down. Instead, he bets for 275, and now we definitely have a decision. I'm never folding with the wheel draw and the nut club draw. Can I be raising in the spot? Yeah, I think so. If I ever think he's raising me light on the flop with a hand like ace, 10 of spades, maybe a hand like ace, king that's just getting frisky. However, if he has a hand like tens or nines, is this a good raise or should I just call and let him continue to bet on the river? I decide just to play the passive route and put in the call. And it looks like we bank the river when the ace of spades peels off in a thousand dollar pot and Paolo does not slow down and instead bets for $475. Now, obviously, I like the ace on the river because I might have improved and I'm now beating hands like queen jack and king queen. However, when he continues to bet and for a small sizing, he's kind of saying he has a decent hand. If he was going to polarize and go for around 800 to 1200, it would either be a bluff or a very strong hand. So this kind of bet almost makes it seem like he somehow got there with an ace jack, ace 10, something like that. Still, I can't arrive on the river with a pair of aces and fold it. So I put in the call. And somehow, someway, he shows me ace-king offsuit for the min-raise on the flop, continues on the turn, binks the river, and gets maximum value versus my ace-four suited. Nice hand, Paolo. Nice hand. All right, the knit game is back on, which means we are back to playing some crazy hands. Nine-deuce suited is the one that we are battling with this time. I'm in the $50 straddle. Benham raises it up to $150. There's two callers over to me and I'm getting a decent enough price. Plus you got to add in the knit game and the $100 per person that I would lose if I lose it. So I decided to toss in the extra 100 bucks and we're off to a flop which comes 8-3-3. Really shouldn't be a board that connects with too many players. 
So when Benham continues to bet for 275, I'm a little bit suspicious of this. Sure, he could have a hand like sevens or sixes or tens or something like that, but he's really rarely gonna have a 3x type of hand. However, you can see if I'm calling nine do suited out of the straddle, I'm also gonna be calling a lot of 3x type of hands. So when the action folds back around to me, I think a check raise is in order. If we can get him to fold right away, we can show our cards, get rid of that nasty knit button and take down this pot. However, if we do get called, we can still tell the story on any spade card or any non like ace, king, something like that. And uh, that's exactly what happens. Benham is not believing the story just yet. He puts in the additional money and we are off the turn, which does come the king of spades. So interestingly enough, I think I would be chuck raising the flop with a lot of spade draws, for instance, seven, six of spades, nine, 10 of spades. And now getting there on the turn, I would have to continue for a bet to credibly tell this story. Additionally, if I had a flush or a three, I would want to continue betting on this turn because the king heavily connects with Benham as opposed to myself. There's 1855 in the middle and I decided to bet out for $700, just making it look like a milky value bet. I would expect Benham to fold a lot of his hands now like pocket fives, fours, sixes, sevens, all of that good stuff. Maybe even some of his 8x like 8, 7, and 8, 9 would find a fold. He makes our heart sink to our stomach when he jams all in for 36, 25 effective. I'm doing a little bit of Hollywooding now, a little bit of saving face. I obviously have to fold my nine deuce of diamonds, but how does he find a jam in the spot? Does he really just have eights full of threes or kings full of threes, something like that? Otherwise, what is he really jamming with on this turn? With a little bit of deliberation, I fold my cards and he turns over ace, jack, offsuit. I get completely owned. Sure, he had the nut flush draw, but uh, I'm telling a story into multiple people that I have a very good hand like a three or a boat or maybe even a flush and I'm just not gonna fold. So I uh, kind of think his raise here is a little bit crazy, but he's winning a $6,200 pot. So I guess what do I know? Nine deuce of diamonds down in flames. And uh, that's not good news for the knit game once again. Moving us right into the next one where we're heads up in the knit game. On the button, it folds to me. I look down at an ace and I got to raise it up. I shove all in. I only have $2,200 in my stack. Still, it's a massive jam, but I don't want to lose the knit game. If I do, it's $700 out of my stack. So that already represents one third of it. I might as well just go all in with an ace. The other player left in the game is in the small blind. So I think he's forced to call off with a lot of worse hands like queen jack, king 10. Uh, a lot of worse hands have to call here in his shoes. He decides to redram and uh, isolate myself so we can go heads up in the knit game all in. And uh, let's go off to a run out. I gotta be ahead here, right? Flop comes kind of weird. King, queen, nine, no help to me. Six of diamonds peels off, followed by the four of hearts. He turns over king, 10 of spades. A pretty great hand to pick up in the small blind. Heads up in the knit game. And just like that, we're losing a $4,500 pot and we have to go into our bag, pay out $100 per person, $700 more. So effectively in that one hand, we just lost $2,900. We were slightly ahead against King 10, so I'm happy I got it in there. Just kind of another needle in our side there, losing with Ace-4 against King 10 and then paying out the knit game as well. What a bad break. All right, I'm gonna give it one more bullet. I rebuy for 7,000 real American dollars and find ourselves in this next hand with queen nine of clubs. Randy on my right puts in the limp. I raise it up to 100, Paolo calls. Randy calls as well. We are three ways to a flop with the three amigos. Queen seven deuce with two spades. Paolo checks it to Randy, who had expected to check to me. However, that's not what he does. Into the $315 pot comes a bet of $100. I call Paolo folds. Off the turn we go, which comes the Jack of Diamonds. Not exactly sure what Randy is leading into me with. Could he have some spade ideas? Could he have a hand like Ace King, Ace Queen, maybe a 7 8 of spades? I don't know. There's a bunch of stuff. I made top pair. I'm stuck a lot of money. I'm definitely not folding. I put in the 200 bucks. Off to the river, which comes a board pairing deuce of diamonds. Really shouldn't change anything. There's 900 in the middle, and Randy is going to go for one last bet. One more attempt to try to get me to fold. However, it's only $250, and I'm not folding top pair for that good of a price. I toss in the call. Randy turns over ace, deuce, offsuit. How does he get there? Ace, deuce, offsuit. I guess it is his own game, so he has a little bit of luck in that aspect. He's taking on that $1,400 pot. I had him the whole way. Maybe I could have raised the flop or the turn, but uh, when people are leading into you, it's usually pretty strong. Ace deuce offsuit, got to applaud the man for playing it. Nice hand, Randy, nice hand. After this hand, I really just didn't have the morale to continue. Plus, we've been playing for around five hours at this point, 
and nothing really seemed to go my way. In the beginning, I was getting a few bluffs through, but uh, none of my value was really holding up. So I decide to be responsible, cash out what's left of my chips, and live to fight another day. Let's bring it to the outro. Well, a rainy day for a kind of sad outro here. My biggest ever private game turned into the biggest loss I've ever had in a private game. A $7,700 loss. And all I have to show for it is this awesome hat that Randy gave me. Uh, Three Coin is his nickname. He made a brand out of it. So at least I got some cool merch out of it. But losing $7,700 in one night, five hours nonetheless, does not feel great. Bunch of weird spots. Uh, a bluff didn't get through against Benham. He just ripped it in with ace jack high. And then the only real cool thing that happened was that second hand where I bluffed Cashman with four or five of clubs. That was obviously a pretty cool play, but it went downhill from there. I lost a knit game twice. Uh, one time I couldn't call when the dude just made it 500 preflop in a 510 game. And the other one I shoved with ace four. Got called in a good spot with king 10 suited and he outflops me. Lost a bunch of other big pots as well. You guys just watched the video. What am I rambling about? But a $7,700 loss definitely hurts. Uh, I'm going to keep firing in big games though. I have the bankroll to do it and I have your support. And uh, I know I'm playing pretty good. I'm just getting unfortunate in a lot of spots. I will also mix in some fun 1, 2, and 2, 5 games to keep it interesting on the channel. But we have a bunch of fun trips coming up. And uh, word on the street is I have a meetup game in Arizona in November. And then I might be heading out to the WSOP in the Bahamas in December to wrap up the rest of the year. So really appreciate all the support. A lot of fun things to look forward to on the channel. Good luck on the felt as always, you guys. I hope you run a lot better than I did tonight. And I'll catch you in the next video as always. Peace. Poker?